This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been accomplishing our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment for 25 years this year. We're celebrating our 25th birthday. We've been doing this since 1990 and as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit all volunteer vegetarian societies in the United States. You might be wondering why we're meeting out in this gorgeous lanai here in Waikiki instead of inside of that also beautiful ballroom. Well, we've had a slight mishap and so we've decided that uh, we're going to make the best of it and I think Dr. Rudolph is going to give you a wonderful talk tonight. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Dustin Rudolph, PharmD. Dustin Rudolph, PharmD, is a clinical pharmacist currently practicing in an acute care hospital setting. He graduated with a Doctor of Pharmacy degree in 2002 from North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. In 2009, Dr. Rudolph adopted a vegetarian diet and then a whole foods plant-based diet, a vegan diet, a year later. He continued his education in the field of health care in 2010 by earning a certificate in plant-based nutrition through the T. Colin Campbell Foundation and E. Cornell University. Dr. Rudolph has become an expert in nutrition and lifestyle medicine and uses his expertise as an educator, speaker, and writer to help others learn how to prevent and reverse chronic diseases. He currently lives in the Tampa Bay area of Florida where he enjoys walking, reading, and cooking healthy plant-based foods, and playing with Sony and Reese, his two furry feline friends. Dr. Rudolph's presentation tonight is entitled, The Secrets to an Empty Medicine Cabinet. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dustin Rudolph. medication, 
well, now you're healthy. You know, if you have diabetes and you're on diabetes medication, that's health. And that's not the case, actually. So I went to the dictionary, and I wanted to look up these words and see exactly what they mean. And optimal, the definition is best or most desirable or most favorable. Health is a state of being free from illness or injury. So therefore, optimal health would be the most desirable or, mo or most desirable or favorable state from illness or injury. We want to avoid illness and injury. We don't want to have diabetes. We don't want to have heart disease. We don't want to have high cholesterol and cancer and, and all these diseases. We want the opposite. We want to be healthy. We want to get rid of all these things or not even get them in the first place. And you know, I have a lot of good information talking about how the medicine and how the food compare with some of these different methods, some of these different disease states. I'm going to talk about heart disease. I'm going to talk about diabetes, and I'm going to talk about cancer, prostate cancer specifically. And those are really the three three big ones in America. Is those diseases? A lot of people suffer from those diseases. So right now in America, actually this is from 2010. I looked up and, and wanted to see how much prescription drugs we use in this country. And it was just north of 3 billion prescriptions. 3 billion drugs were ordered by physicians' offices, hospital outpatient departments, and hospital emergency rooms. 3.16 billion prescriptions. That is a lot of medication. And if you take that and you divide it by the census of our nation here, there's about 320 million people in the U.S. And so if you take about 3 billion divided by about 300 million, that's like between 10 and 12 prescriptions for every man, woman, and child walking around the U.S. That is just crazy. And not everybody takes drugs. About 70% of people are on at least one medication, and about 50% of people are on two or more medications in the United States. So what does this do for us in America? All these three billion prescriptions, these three billion drug orders that we give out every year, what does that get us? And as you can see in my slide here, it just gives us more tests, more procedures, more surgeries, more hospital stays. So it doesn't really lead to optimal health, it leads to optimal chronic sickness is what it leads to. And, uh, and unfortunately, when most patients go in, they're, they're thinking that they're going to take all these prescription drugs and that their health is going to improve. And actually, just the opposite happens is they either kind of stay where they are or eventually they get worse. I've never seen in my entire career or even read about a patient taking more and more drugs and getting better and, and all these diseases reversing that with drugs. Okay, so do the pills work? And a lot of, a lot of times when people meet me, especially colleagues of mine, or people who don't know me and they realize that I'm a pharmacist, I'm a full-time pharmacist, I work as a pharmacist, that's my career. They go, aren't you, isn't what you're doing actually counteracting what you stand for? Isn't that kind of an oxymoron thing? And I go, yeah, absolutely it does. And they, and they think that, well, if I think this way and I preach this, that I must be against all medications. All medications are terrible. And that's actually not the case. Do, so do the pills work? My answer is yes, they do work. They just don't work as well as we'd hoped them to. And a lot of times the diet and the lifestyle is what's needed instead. So we're going to go over actually how well those pills actually do work. So we have a lot of unanswered questions with, with our medical system the way it is. We have more pills and more pills and more pills and more surgeries, and it leaves us with patients going from doctor to doctor to hospital to hospital to do all these tests and try to find out what's wrong with them and how to fix them, and it's as simple as food. So before I get into the drugs, I want to talk about the three keys to success for optimal health, and it's just getting back to the basics. Number one, we have to do proper, we have to have a proper nutritional plan. So that consists of a whole foods, plant-based, vegan diet. You know, the fruits, the veggies, the legumes, the whole grains, those kind of foods, that's what actually produces health. And many of you out, out there have been to these kind of talks before, you know that. And number two is regular physical activity. You gotta move your body. So whether you're walking, jogging, running, biking, swimming, uh, gardening, anything to move your body. The more that you move your body, the better off you're going to feel. So that's number two. 
And then number three is just positive lifestyle choices. So we all know that smoking is bad for us and, and should stay away from alcohol. Also, we need to get the proper amount of sleep. And then loving relationships, that's really important. Uh, I remember reading the book by John Robbins, Healthy at 100, and a lot of these, organiza or a lot of these populations that have the longest lived populations, healthy populations in the world, one of the things they had in common was loving relationships, the social network. Just like you guys are here today, all supporting each other, learning from one another, and making this easier for yourself. So that's really important too. So now we get into the nitty gritty. And this usually shocks people, this topic, and this is what I bring up is how studies are reported with how the medications work and what we're told and what is actually happening is two different things. So what you see on TV or what you see in a magazine ad or on a radio ad, radio commercial, you usually hear drug X reduces your cholesterol by 50% or drug Y reduces your rate of heart attacks by 40%. And that sounds really good. You know, sign me up, I wanna take that drug, right? And that's, you, that's not how the actual medication comes out when you actually look at these studies. So I'm going to explain the difference between relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. Relative risk reduction is what you hear on all those advertisements and commercials. And to explain this and to kind of put it into perspective so you can understand, say if we have drug X and we're going to try treating people with drug X for five years, and we're gonna to try to reduce the amount of heart attacks or prevent heart attacks. So we, what we'd normally do is we'd put 100 people in this group, and we put 100 people in this group. And then one group we're gonna give drug X, and one group we're just gonna give them placebo, a sugar pill, it doesn't have anything in it. And then we're gonna follow them for five years and see who has heart attacks, how many people have heart attacks in the, in the drug X group, and how many people have heart attacks in the placebo group. And then we can see, obviously, the drug we hope is going to work and prevent heart attacks. So we would hope that the number would be lower with the number of heart attacks. And that's usually what happens. And that's, the drugs do work, like I said. So the, but this is how well they work. This is how this gets reported. Let's say in the drug X category, out of the 100 people, two people have a heart attack in five years. And out of the placebo category, the sugar pill, four people have a heart attack over five years. So what does that mean? This is what that means. Relative risk reduction is a 50% reduction in heart attacks. Now where did they get that number? They got that number by taking the placebo group, four people had a heart attack, and the drug X group, two people had a heart attack. So is two half of four? Of course. So they call it 50% reduction in heart attacks. Is there more than six people in the study? Yes, of course there is. So they forgot about the other people who didn't have heart attacks. The absolute risk reduction is 2% because four out of 100 people having a heart attack is 4%. Two people out of 100 having a heart attack is 2%. So when you take that 4% and you minus the 2%, you end up with 2%. So the drug reduces heart attack with an absolute risk reduction of 2%. That's a big, big difference, 50% and 2%. What do you think is more marketable, 50% or 2%? So now I'm gonna go actually go over some of the medications that we use for these different disease states and I'm gonna show you what the actual studies say. I'm gonna start off with heart disease. The most common disease in the world. It kills 50% of the people in the world and in the United States. One of the most common medications to treat heart, heart disease and try to prevent heart attacks and strokes is aspirin. You've all heard it. An aspirin a day keeps the doctor away, right? Well, for a fraction of the amount of people who take the aspirin, that's true. So if you look at the absolute risk reduction, and I got these numbers if you see on the bottom of the slide, it's called the NNT.com. And it's a group of physicians, I believe they're up in the New England area. They, are, they went through the scientific literature and they looked and they looked for the absolute risk reduction in multiple studies and then they put out their own reviews. So you can go on the NNT.com, you can find out different disease states and different drugs that they use these um, 
you, that they use the drugs to treat for these disease states, and they'll show you the absolute risk reduction. You don't have to do any work and, and read scientific studies or anything. And what they showed is aspirin to prevent a first heart attack or stroke after one year, there was a 0% help, 0% were helped by avoiding death. Nobody was helped. 0.05% were helped by preventing a non-fatal heart attack. 0.01% were helped by avoiding a non-fatal stroke. And then 0.03% were harmed by bleeding because aspirin causes thinning of the blood and they found bleeding a problem in some people who take aspirin. So you can see that the actual benefits and the harms are not nearly as what, what they seem to be. The benefits are much, much lower. Now what, what happens if you take people who have already had a heart attack? That's called secondary prevention. And let's put those people on an on a aspirin. What happens then? Does it work any better? And yes, it does work very, it does work better, but it doesn't work tremendously amount better. The numbers are about the same. So in secondary prevention, they actually looked at studies and the average length of time was two years. And they found that the absolute risk reduction in, in death was 0.3%. So at least some lives were saved. But 0.3% is not a huge amount. And again, preventing heart attacks and stroke, you're, you're looking at anywhere from a half to a little bit over 1% were prevented heart attacks and strokes. And again, the same about the same bleeding complications with that. So when you look at that, that's much different than what you would hear on the radio or on the TV or in the magazine ad. Next I want to go over statins, because we love our statins in America, everybody loves their statins. Statins, I once heard, I think Dr. Esselstyn says, why don't they just put it in the drinking water? He said, you know, some people think that they should just put it in the drinking water, because statins are miracle, miracle drugs. But unfortunately, the absolute risk reduction in the data on statins is not much better than aspirin. So what about statins to prevent our first heart attack or stroke? Five years, they looked at these drugs. And the absolute risk reduction for avoiding death, again, in primary, primary prevention, was 0%. Nobody avoided dying from taking a statin if they've never had a heart attack or stroke. And it was under 2% for avoiding a heart attack or stroke. It was about the same you know, as aspirin with secondary prevention, 0.4 to 1.6% avoided a heart attack or stroke. But the side effects are worse with statins. Side effects include muscle weakness, muscle pain, muscle cramps. A lot of people have this. 10% of the people who take statins, one out of every 10, will have some kind of muscle issue or muscle, muscle condition that develops and then they have to stop taking the drug. And one of these is called rhabdomyolysis and that's really, really a horrible condition. That's where you actually have to be hospitalized because it just starts to kind of eat away your muscles. And then, 2% are actually harmed by statins and they get diabetes from taking the statins. And I've actually seen in other studies where if it's an elderly person taking statins, that can go up to 9% develop diabetes from the statins. So when you look at that, that's just kind of mind blowing that the benefits are so low, yet the side effects are so high. Now for secondary prevention for statins and preventing a heart attack or a stroke, Again, it's five years. The numbers really aren't that much better. You're still looking at about a little bit over 1% and up to about 2.5%, 3% are avoiding a heart attack or a stroke or avoiding death. And that's the best that they can do, statins. The same side effects as above as, as the primary prevention. So the statins are not the miracle drugs that we hope that they will be. They do help a few people, but most people, they don't help at all. Okay, what about the diet? And there's been a number of physicians who have done studies on heart attacks, strokes, heart disease, and diet with this whole foods, plant-based, vegan diet. You've probably seen some of them speak here before or at other places. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn is one of them. He has gotten the best results of anybody I've seen in the literature. And last July 2014, he published his second, his biggest study, putting people on his whole foods plant-based diet and reversing their heart, halting or reversing their heart disease. And with his diet, in his second study, see the first time, I want to mention his first, first study several years ago, he had about 
18 patients in there, I believe, and he had a 100% uh, success rate in halting the disease, about a 73% success rate in reversing the disease, and you know that's phenomenal numbers and no side effects. There's no side effects to that. Well, you know, in the scientific world, people say, well, that's not enough people. You only had 18 people in there, and even though you're 100% success rate, that's just not good enough. So you got to have more people. So he goes, okay, I'll have more people. So this time he had 177 people in this study that followed his, that were compliant, 100% compliant with his vegan whole food plant-based diet. 81% saw improvement. And by that it means symptom redu reduction or re reversal of disease. Another 8% remained stable, so they halted their heart disease. So that's 89% of his patients either halted or got better or you know reversed their disease. That's a lot. What about the other 9, 10, 11%? What about those people? Why didn't he hit the 100% mark? Well, it wasn't all due to diet. You know, some of these patients had a heart arrhythmia and they didn't end up going on a medication for that. The whole foods plant-based diet, as, as good as it does work with a lot of disease, disease states, for heart arrhythmias, it does not reverse those. And sometimes the best thing we, that we have is the medication. So we had some patients have that issue and not go on the recommended medication. He had some people who were on a medication who just went off their medication on their own without talking to their doctor and it was for conditions that would require the medication. So they ended up experiencing a cardiac event. Then I think he had one patient who had prior, uh, so prior cardiac damage to their heart and they actually needed surgery and when they went into the study they were eventually going to need surgery and while they were in the study they had surgery so that kind of counted against it even though it wasn't the diet's fault so that that's why that played into the into the 10 percent or 11 percent only one person out of 177 had a stroke or any cardiac event one person out of 177 so when you look at the diet and how well it worked and who didn't get better and for the reasons why they didn't get better, 99.4% of the people got better or stayed the same on the diet. That's incredible. Can you imagine if we had a drug that got 99.4% benefits from it and no side effects? That is, that is just incredible. Okay, enough about heart disease. I'm going to talk about type 2 diabetes now. Type 2 diabetes is skyrocketing. There is, the last time that I looked at it, I believe it was right around 79 or 80 million people who had diabetes or prediabetes in America. And that is about one in every four or five people. That is a lot of people with diabetes. So this, this disease affects a lot of people and diabetes is an awful disease. It, it has so many complications that come with it. There's kidney injury, there's ki kidney disease, there's blindness that can happen, infections that can happen, limb amputations that can happen, uh, diabetic foot ulcers that can happen. There's all kinds of in cardiac disease that you can get on top of it. So there's all kinds of complications of diabetes. So I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. So how do the drugs work with diabetes? Type 2 diabetes, that is. We're not talking about type 1 diabetes, which is uh, autoimmune disease that develops in childhood and you can't reverse that once it happens because the beta cells in the pancreas are permanently destroyed so you can't reverse that with diet we're talking about type 2 diabetes which is solely due to diet so we give we give type 2 diabetics a lot of pills in in our country to try to combat that those high sugar levels well how do the pills work one of the most common pills is called metformin. Anybody heard of it? Metformin, glucophage? A couple people have heard of that? Good. It's, it's considered really one of the safest drugs for diabetes. And when you look at the absolute risk reduction, it actually has a decent absolute risk reduction when it comes to drugs, with what we're talking about. After about 10, 10.7 years of follow-up, there was a 6.3% were helped, diabetics were helped by avoiding a heart attack by taking metformin. 
Again, cardiac disease is a, another complication that can develop with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. 10% were helped by preventing any diabetic complication. So any kind of infection or limb amputation or blindness or kidney disease, 10% were helped. That's pretty good for a drug. That's actually one of the best absolute risk reductions that I've seen. That's about as good as you're going to get. And another 5.3% were helped by avoiding diabetes-related death. So, you know, that's much better than, than the other drugs that we've been talking about so far. But still, if there's another way to do this and get much better results and have no side effects, why wouldn't we want to do that? Because diabetes drugs, just like cardiac drugs, have side effects. Metformin, about 2 to 12% approximately, will have a lot of GI effects. So they'll have stomach upset, uh, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, gas, they'll get those kind of side effects and some people they just can't take that and they actually end up stopping the metformin because of that. So do medications, first of all medications do not treat type 2 diabetes, I think you know that by now. And when we're talking about the cause of type 2 diabetes, usually we talk about insulin resistance. How about a show of hands? Anybody have heard of anybody's heard of insulin resistance or know what that is? A lot of people have heard of insulin resistance. A lot of the doctors, pharmacists, registered dietitians, uh, diabetic educators—they all talk about insulin resistance. But insulin resistance is not the cause of type two diabetes. So we have to carry the conversation forward beyond that if we're going to tackle this disease and do it correctly. The root cause of type two diabetes is little tiny particles of fat that are in your muscle cells and they're called intramyocellular lipids. Some of you have, may have heard that term. Those actually end up causing the insulin resistance in the first place. So if we can attack the problem there, we can attack the root cause of diabetes. Now how do we do that? Of course, we do it with diet. I want to show you what that, what that looks like because it's hard to envision it without seeing a picture. So you can see on the screen here, I have a picture of a muscle cell. And on the muscle cell, there's some receptors. There's some proteins, they act as a receptor. One of these is an insulin receptor. What happens when you eat is that your body takes in food, it, it digests it, it absorbs it, it breaks down the food, these, those carbohydrates into simple glucose. That's the simplest form of sugar. And your body needs that glucose, that's the primary primary uh, form of energy that your body uses. So it needs that glucose. Carbs are good when it's broken down and used that way. So in order for this glucose to get inside the muscle cell, insulin has to be present. When you eat, that signals to your brain that, hey, Dustin ate. Pancreas, produce some insulin, release some insulin. We need that in our body. So insulin is released from the pancreas. It goes around the bloodstream and it finds these insulin receptors on these muscle cells. Once it attaches to the insulin receptor, there's a protein receptor that's called a GLUT4 transporter, a glu glucose transporter for, GLUT4 transporter for short. That is usually closed. Once insulin attaches to its receptor, it opens that doorway of the GLUT4 transporter. Then glucose can come into the cell, which is where it can be used. Because we have the powerhouses of the cell, the mitochondria, which take that glucose, put it into the Krebs cycle, and then it makes ATP, which is energy. So that's how a, a normal person's body would work. And also in these muscle cells is intramyocellular lipids. So we have these little tiny particles of fat shown in yellow here, these little blobs of yellow. Those are the tiny particles of fat that we have. And we need that fat because you're not eating 24-7, and in times of fasting or when you're not eating, you need that fat so that you can have some sort of energy. Well, this is a normal cell. This is not a normal cell. This is a type 2 diabetic cell. You see the difference? I'll try to move over here so some of you can see that. There's a whole lot more intramyocellular lipids. There's a whole lot, little, a whole lot more of these little yellow blobs of, of fat inside those muscle cells. And that's a problem because what that does is it clogs up the insulin receptor. It blocks the insulin receptor from letting the insulin attach to it. Why, why would that be a big deal? Because if insulin can't attach to the receptor, guess what doesn't open? The GLUT4 transporter protein. So that 
that stays closed and then glucose stays in the bloodstream and blood glucose levels remain high. That's the cause of insulin resistance. So we can't target this unless we fix the food. That's how we fix this. So there's been studies using a whole foods plant-based diet and type 2 diabetics and it works literally works miracles. It works wonders. A whole foods plant-based diet is naturally low in fat. It's about anywhere from 7 to 15 percent fat. A lot of the studies that are done on this are done right around in the 10 percent range. And this leads to the halting and reversal of disease in compliant patients. And that's the key word is compliant. You can't cheat here and there and, and one thing turns into another and then your type 2 diabetes comes back. So you got to be compliant. You got to be up on this. So that's really important that you stick with a whole foods plant based diet with this naturally low in fat because little particles of fat are the problem. And in studies when they looked at this, putting people on this diet with this, with this type 2 diabetes, they found sustained weight loss, so permanent weight loss. They found that the HbA1c levels go down. Now the HbA1c levels, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, that's basically a 90-day average in blood sugar. So that's, that's the level that your doctor checks and you can't cheat on that. You can cheat on your blood sugar, you can just not eat and then go in and get your blood sugar checked and it can be low. But you can't cheat on this because this is a 90-day average of your blood sugars. So that went down. Total and LDL cholesterol levels went down. That's probably why it helps so many people, helps so many diabetics prevent heart disease as well. And then, this is astonishing, 71% of study participants were able to reduce or eliminate their medications who were diabetics. They were able to dramatically reduce or even get rid of their medications. That's, that's astounding. That's what we want. So that's type 2 diabetes. Now I want to go on to prostate cancer because cancer is the second leading cause of death in the U.S. and it affects millions and millions of people. One of the most common causes, or one of the most common cancers that we have in America is prostate cancer. It kills many, many men every year and a lot of men are diagnosed with this. So what do we do for prostate cancer? Well, usually what happens is the urologist or the surgeon says, well, let's cut out the prostate. That's, that's what has the cancer. Let's just cut it out. Or they might put you on medication. They might put you on some um, androgen deprivation therapy. And I'm going to talk about that now. So how do the surgery and the, and the pills work? Well, again, this is absolute risk reduction. Surgical removal of prostate for localized prostate cancer. And this is after a 15-year follow-up. So they really followed these patients for a long time. This is if they went and they cut the prostate out completely. In people who had localized prostate cancer, what that means is you have cancer that's just in the prostate gland. So it hasn't spread you know, to the other organs and the, and the liver and the, the rest of the body. It's just in the prostate cancer. So you think that if you just cut it out, you'd be fine. It'd go away, right? Well, only 6.1% were helped by avoiding death from prostate cancer. That's not very good. And I'm sure that you've heard this before. When cancer affects you, it doesn't just pop up overnight. You don't just get cancer and then you wake up the next day and, oh my God, I have cancer. That's been brewing in you for 10, 20, 30 years. So just because it's in the prostate doesn't mean it might not be right next door, but just not detectable. You know, so, so surgical removal, that's why it does help some people, but it doesn't get it all sometimes. Men less than 65 years, old, 65 years old were the ones who benefited the most, so the younger guys. And the thing that really gets me about prostate cancer treatment is the side effects. It's horrendous. Look at the numbers. 18 to 28 percent were harmed by developing urinary incontinence. They couldn't go to the bathroom for the rest of their life. 18 to 28 percent. 26 to 36 percent were harmed by erectile dysfunction. That's a tremendous amount of men who go undergo this treatment. There is medication for prostate cancer. It's called androgen deprivation therapy. So drugs might, that you might have heard of are Lupron, Casodex, and a few others. And the theory behind this is that in men who have higher levels of testosterone, they usually have a higher risk of prostate cancer and higher rates of prostate cancer. So if we give a medication to reduce the testosterone in the body, 
you think that maybe the prostate cancer would go away or it would get better. So they took people, they took men who had localized prostate cancer, again, it's just found in the prostate gland, and they put them on this androgen deprivation therapy, these medications. And what they found is that the men actually got worse. It was associated with an increase in prostate cancer's death versus watchful waiting. And what watchful waiting is, is many times with localized prostate cancer is very slow growing, so your doctor will say, let's just kind of watch it and wait and see where you go because you'll probably die of something else before you die of the prostate cancer. So let's just watch and wait. So when they put this to the test and they put watchful waiting against these drugs, the drugs actually killed more men with prostate cancer than, than just watchful waiting. And then on top of that, these poor men, 27 to 49% actually experienced erectile dysfunction. So not only did you have a higher increased risk of dying from prostate cancer from the medication, but then you had erectile dysfunction and up to almost half of men who, who underwent this. And that was over a seven year period. So they followed these men for a long time too. That's not very good. That's not very good at all. Well, what about the diet? And one physician who has really led the way in this is Dean Ornish. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He has actually been one of the only physicians that I've seen that has published a study in a peer-reviewed evidence-based journal on putting people on a, on a whole foods plant-based diet and treating a cancer of any kind. And what he did is he got a group of men, he put them on this whole foods plant-based diet. So no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no, no processed foods. He put them on just fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, just good, wholesome plant foods. And what happened? Well, we don't have data on how many men died so many years later, like we do with the drugs and the surgery. The best that we have is what he did was check the PSA levels. And how many men out there have heard of PSA levels or maybe had the experience of getting PSA levels done? So a couple of you have. So you go to your doctor, you get a PSA level, and that's a, just an easy blood draw. It's not very invasive. It's quick and easy. They send it to the blood lab. They check your PSA level. What happens is in men with prostate cancer, their PSA levels are usually high. So the higher the PSA level, the worse it is. But the problem with PSA testing is that there's a lot of false positives and there's a lot of false negatives. So that means that sometimes it's high and you don't have any problems. So what they'll do is if it's high, they'll go in and they'll biopsy the pro prostate gland and see under a microscope if there's cancer cells there to prove it. And sometimes you, you get men with high PSA levels and they don't have any problems. They don't have cancer. So they went uh, underwent a biopsy for no reason at all. And then sometimes you have PSA levels that are normal and the man has prostate cancer when they, when they check it out further. So th it's not the most reliable test that we have, but it's kind of the best thing that we have other than doing an invasive biopsy, which you really want to tend to avoid uh, first because a lot of people will get the same kind of problems, urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction, all these, all these problems that the drugs and the surgeries get. So what Dean Ornish found was that when he put people on this whole foods plant-based diet, he followed them for one year, and the, the group that was on the whole foods plant-based diet, their PSA levels actually went down. So they were trending the right way. The 4% reduction in PSA levels on this diet. And then in addition, no additional men needed treatment for prostate cancer. So nobody really got worse. So that's a really good sign. What about the other group, the control diet? The other group, he just said, you know, stay in your regular diet, um, keep seeing your physician, keep doing what you normally do, status quo. That group actually saw a 6% increase in PSA levels on the standard control diet. So we're going the wrong way here. We're going up, not down. So they got worse with a Western type diet, and that's, that's you know, meat, dairy, eggs, processed foods, a lot of all the stuff that, that isn't good for you. And then six of the 49 men in that group actually required additional treatment for their prostate cancer because their cancer was obviously getting worse. So that's a, that's a huge, huge difference between 
being on the right diet, a, a properly constructed whole foods plant-based vegan diet, and being on a standard control diet, or using the drugs and using the surgeries to treat this. Completely different spectrum. So like I said, that's the only study that we have that I know of that has put people on an interventional study, put them on the exact diet, a whole foods plant-based diet for cancer, and published it in a medical journal. We have a lot of data that's out there right now that's, that's good data and they, you know, it's observational studies that they go and they look at a population, they, see the can they look at the cancer rates and then they see, you know, they pass out surveys and they say, what did you eat? What have you been eating for the past year or two years or 10 years or whatever it is? And in those kind of studies, we do see that the populations that eat the most plant-based foods and the more plants you eat, the less animals you eat, the less less cancer that you have, the less cancer that are in those populations. Those are really good studies, but those aren't, those show a correlation. Those, those show, there, there's a possibility here, there's a good pops possibility that one might have something to do with the other. But these interventional studies are really important because then you're putting the person on the exact diet that you're testing and you're seeing if it has a, has a change in, in the outcome of the disease. And that's more of a direct cause and effect relationship that's showing there. So those are much higher quality studies and can actually show you directly, yes, it's definitely due to diet instead of we think it's due to diet. Um, so currently, like I said, there's no absolute risk reduction data for morbidity or mortality using a whole foods plant-based diet with any cancer of any kind. Hopefully someday that we will have that. You know, I hope by the end of my career we have all kinds of studies to show that. Um, that would be wonderful because then we'll have more ammunition to, to hit people up with to say, you know, this really works. It's really good for you. And what I always like to tell people is that not all cancers are created equal. This is important because I, d I don't want anybody to go home and, you know, maybe, in the, maybe you have cancer or maybe eventually you get diagnosed with cancer. There's all kinds of different cancers out there and they're all just a little bit different. Some respond very well to diet. Those are usually breast, prostate, and colon cancer. So with those diet, or the, with those cancers, the, diet, the whole foods plant-based diet usually works pretty well. But there's some that the medications and the, and the other interventions that we do in medicine work much better for. Um, I believe like testicular cancers, lymphomas, leukemias, those kind of cancers um, actually are, work pretty well with the medications. So just to always do your, always perform your due diligence if you have cancer because it really is a matter of life and death and it's important that you do your homework. The more that you know, the more knowledge that you have, you know, knowledge is power. And then you can make an informed decision about your health. So uh, with that, the I just wanted to kind of end with, I hope that people would adopt this kind of lifestyle and this diet because it works so well and there's so little side effects to it. I actually have never heard of any major side effects other than maybe some extra gas for a few weeks that you have. But I, I, I could certainly live with that over all these other terrible side effects that happens with drugs. And it works better, it just works so much better than the drugs. You know, the medications, do they work? Yes. They just don't work as very well, as well as we'd hoped that they would work. And, you know, you did, the, more, the more that you know, the more you know how these studies are reported, absolute risk reduction versus relative risk reduction, the, the more better informed decision that you can make regarding your health. So we, meet, we need more love, more compassion, and more plant foods in the world. And we need less medication, less pills, and less surgeries and procedures in the world. Thank you. You want to do Q and A? Yeah. Okay, we'll do some Q and A. You do, you tell me when to cut off because I can keep going all night. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. And my question was on the actually the first slide with um, the hundred uh, plant uh, drug X and placebo X. The people in both groups know what they were getting that they could be getting a placebo, which is no no drug. At all? Well, that's a good question. The, the question was in that one of those first slides that I put up and explaining relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. 
whether the people know whether they're getting the drug or they're getting the placebo. And it depends. It depends on if they blind the study. And you've probably heard, or some of you have probably heard, where you know they'll have a double-blinded study or a blinded study. And what that means is when they blind the study, they either have the patients not know what they get, or they have the clinicians administering the drugs not know what they're giving, or they have both groups not know what they're giving and get giving and getting. And actually, that's beneficial because when you have both the person treating and the person getting the drug not know what they're getting, whether it's a placebo or the actual drug, you have less bias. Because there's, there's a placebo effect. You've heard of the placebo effect? That's where if you take this medication, you go, well, I'm taking a medication, so I know it's going to help me, and I know I'm going to get better. So sometimes you do that, and then you know maybe you feel better. And maybe it's a subjective thing that they're looking at, and they can't just test your cholesterol or something to have hard facts. Maybe they're testing pain for arthritis, or they're testing some other thing that's, well, how do you feel? Well, I feel pretty good. You know, and if you know what you're getting, if you're actually getting the drug, then more people are going to tend to think, well, I'm taking the actual drug, so I feel pretty good. So, I, and I still don't quite understand, so if you're a person in the study, uh, do you, have you signed up for a study know, knowing that you could get yes. it? Yes. So you, when they do these studies, when they do these studies, they... Repeat question. Okay, the question was, the follow-up question was, when you sign up, if you're a patient and you sign up for these studies, do you, do you know beforehand that you're going to get the pill or you're not going to get the pill? And the answer is yes, because they design these studies and they tell you if it's blinded or if it's not blinded. So you're going to know going into the study that I don't know what I'm going to get. I might get one or the other. I have no idea. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. So I was wondering how much confidence do you have in these drug trials that are done when there has been evidence that pharmaceutical companies and their researchers have doctored results, have actually lied on uh, some of these studies. We can't really depend, it's a built, this is something that they're depending on as some new wonder drug that may be billions of dollars to their bottom line. So how confident are we to be that these studies are actually conducted in an objective and truly scientific way? That's a great point. The question was, is these studies, a lot of these studies are possibly funded by the drug company. A lot of them can be funded. Some can be funded by um, third parties that have nothing to do with selling the actual drug, but some of these, a lot of these studies are funded by the people who are selling the drug, and how confident am I that the studies are actually objective and actually they are reporting the right results and doing the right thing instead of just kind of doctoring up the, the paperwork. And that's a good point, because there I have read a lot about a lot of these studies it, it tends to, and the antidepressants is, the antidepressant class of medications is one that I've read a lot about. And there's several of the studies that don't even get published that are funded by the drug companies because they show that the medication either didn't work or made things worse. So when you have a drug company who's selling a drug and they're paying for the study, they want their study to look good. Because when the drug comes out, they don't want to uh, publish a study and go, you know, we had this great drug for this, this uh, you know, de depression or anxiety or, or whatever it is, but it hurt a lot of people and, and nobody got better. They don't want to publish that because then they can't sell their drug. So they want to publish the studies that say, you know, our drug works great and there's a few side effects, but it worked really good. So. When you, back to your point, I think it was, 
I remember uh, Dr. Ben Goldacre actually talks about this. He's over in the UK. He talks about this quite a bit. So if you Google Ben Goldacre, he actually talks about this quite a bit. A lot of studies go unpublished in, in literature, and then the ones that are published always seem to favor the drug. I believe it was 20% was the statistic where if the published is studied and it's favorable and it's funded by a drug company, 20% of the studies come out a little bit better than they actually are. So there are third party, comp or usually governments and organizations that do fund studies that have nothing to do with selling the drug. And that's what I'm talking about. When, when they do similar studies compared to the drug companies, the drug companies' studies usually come out about 20% better for the drugs. So we can only do what we can with the published literature. And whenever I see it's published by a certain organization that has something to do with selling the drug or financial interest in, in the entity that they're, they're dealing with, I always take that with a grain of salt. And I always just try to, it doesn't mean that the study is worthless. It just means that let's look at kind of who's doing this. And it's probably a little bit more favorable than it actually is. To yeah, answer your question. Okay. okay, the question was how far are we with gene testing with medications? So, uh, basically, how far are we from going to able, being able to go in, test your DNA, see what your genes is, and then seeing how a specific drug works for your genetic makeup? And I think we're just barely touching that subject right now. I haven't read much of anything with that very little, and we're certainly nowhere near, as far as I know, putting that into common practice. I think we're decades away from that, if anything. I know that they've, they've finally worked on the, the human genome, and we're kind of mapping that out. They've mapped that out, but to actually find out which treatments work better for which sets of genes, I think we're a long, long ways away from that. I haven't seen anything that's going to come up tomorrow. Did you touch on vitamins at all? Vitamins? Yeah, so that's a great question. The question was, what about vitamins, as, as far as taking vitamins as supplements, not taking vitamins in chopped up kale and, and good veggies? So that's a good question, and it's a question I get a lot. And what I would tell you is that you're really no better off getting your vitamins in a pill, and what you should try to do is get them from whole natural foods. Other than vitamin B12, actually there's only two vitamins that are not made are that are not in existence in plants, and that is vitamin D and vitamin B12. And vitamin D, you can get sunshine, and you just get out, especially in Hawaii here, there's tons of sun here. So you just go outside for 10, 15 minutes a day and get some sun exposure. That usually does it for most people. Vitamin B12 is normally found in animal foods, as many of you know, because the animal eats the plants that have it, and then they pass it along to us. So. Nowadays, it's important to be on a B12 if you're vegan because that may be deficient, may be deficient in, in that diet. And B12 deficiency develops over a matter of years, anywhere from three to six, seven years before you start seeing symptoms. So it's important to get that vitamin. I do encourage people to supplement with that vitamin. But other than that, I do not encourage vitamins. And the reason why, I'll give you some specific reasons why. In my book, I actually have a whole chapter on vitamins. It's called Supplementing Wisely. And I go into the studies on a lot of these multivitamins or separate vitamins that are given you know, by themselves. And folic acid, vitamin A, and vitamin E actually all show an increased risk of cancer if you take them in supplement form. That's what the studies have said. So I certainly wouldn't want to tell somebody or encourage somebody to take some of these vitamins if it causes an increased risk in cancer. I'm trying to get rid of cancer. I don't want people to get cancer. So it's better to get them from whole foods. When you get them from whole foods, the studies say that when you get the vitamin A, the vitamin E, and the folic acid from whole foods, you actually have a decreased risk in cancer. So you're better off not doing anything then. And most multivitamins have vitamin A, vitamin E, and folic acid in them. So that you're much better off not getting the vitamins in supplement form. That's a good question. His question was on GMO foods and GMO foods versus organic and the health consequences that might be coming along because of the GMO foods. And does our body not recognize those GMO foods and then it causes problems? And what I'll say to that is, 
to, to look at any any drug, any supplement, any food, any diet, any treatment, surgery, procedure, anything that you're going to look at to treat the human body or to prevent illness in the human body, the best available evidence and studies that can be done are controlled interventional studies. There are interventional studies, like, like I said, where you put some people on a specific diet or uh, the pill, you know, whatever medication you're testing or doing whatever surgery or procedure you're doing and then following those people and then seeing what happens. That's the best way to show cause and direct cause and effect. And right now, we don't really have that data out there on GMO foods. So there could be, I mean, it could be causing more health issues. But right now, those are the studies we really need to say, yes, absolutely, these GMO foods are causing this problem. So we shouldn't be eating them. So it's, it's not that I encourage people to eat GMOs, because I'd rather be safe than sorry. And what happens 50 years from now, and we do have those studies, and it does say these foods cause a problem. And we have direct, you know, controlled interventional studies that show it. Well, then I don't want to be behind the eight ball. You know, I want, I'd, I'd rather be preventing it and being on the safe side than the sorry side and doing organic and non-GMO foods. Does that answer your question? Right, goes back to his question. Is it Con <coughs> Right, the same, the same point that he, he's kind of bringing up there is on foods, instead of talking about the drug trials and the drug companies funding the drug trials, what about food studies and if the food industry is funding the food studies? Well, th that's going to be the same thing, you know? You're still going to have a financial interest, and anytime you have a financial interest in something, that entity is going to do whatever they can to make their food or whatever they're selling look good and try to cover up any bad effects from it, so. Can I buy one of your books? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Dustin Rudolph, for an amazingly compelling and informative talk tonight, um, conducted under somewhat stressful conditions. <laughs> so really amazed that you're cool and uh, uh, really appreciate your talk tonight. Mahalo to all of the rest of you for coming, and I really appreciate your sticking around uh, also. Uh, we've got a really good group tonight. So so if you can um, just, has everybody had something to eat tonight that wanted something great? Thank you very much, Phyllis, for doing that. Really appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you all for coming tonight. Have a safe return home. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Mahalo. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.